We're live. We are live. Okay, that's awesome. I'm not seeing it on my screen, but I believe it's it just it's about 30 seconds for some people, and then everybody should have it. Okay. Yep, we're live. We're live. So those of you uh, in the group that were waiting by your phone, by your computer to for us to go live, we're a couple of minutes late, just trying to figure out a couple of technical issues, but I think we are here. So uh, we're going to give um, folks a little bit of time to hop on. I'm seeing people are joining us. Uh, and as you are hopping on, uh, let us know where you're hopping on from. So I'm just an hour outside of Toronto, Ontario. Um, John, where are you? Uh, I'm in Vancouver, Canada, so I'm just getting up. And Tony, where are you? I am in the suburbs of Chicago, so just right outside of the city. And Sam, yourself? Uh, I'm in Norwich, UK, and it's 4 p.m. here, so I'm really crossing my fingers and my dogs aren't going to start barking for their dinner. So. <laughs> Well, my uh, toddler woke up from her nap in the middle of the Facebook Live yesterday. Ah, uh, so brilliant. Life happens here. Uh, <laughs> it is actually live. Uh, so let's uh, start with uh, introductions. This is uh, a power quad right here. Uh, so I've asked uh, Coach Tony to be here today. Uh, Tony, can you give us a little intro? What do you do and uh, who do you coach and in what? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so I have worked with PN um, for a lot of years now, and um, I started as a PN coach, coaching um, in the women's coaching program. Uh, I have recently in the last couple of years, I've moved over and I now um, teach and coach in the L2 um L2 certification program. So if you are part of the L2 group, uh, you might have me as uh, your instructor slash coach. Um, and I also in, oversee all of our um, internal coaching. So men's and women's coaching here at PN and um, coaching operations. So I, do, I, have a few, I have a few hats. Basically. Yes, they all include the word coaching in it, though. Did you hear yeah. that? If anyone yeah. here who's tuning in on live has had an honor of being coached. Bye, Tony. I bet some of you might be in her level two right uh, now. Or Suzanne is. Yeah, Suzanne's yeah. on. Yep. Yeah. And you have coached how many women through PN coaching program? Like hundreds? It's, it must be. Over oh, time. yeah. Over 1,500. So um, I have coached, I think it's somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 um, women in the coaching program. Um, okay. Although I'm not You're doing impressed that. with that number. So 1,500 to 2,000 clients coach, can you give us a thumbs up in the comments? Because I, 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 I'm I, giving thumbs up right here. Okay, well, thank you, <laughs> thank you. It, it's been a lot, but um, yeah, no, it's been good. Thanks, Tony. Sam. Hi, yeah, um, so I am a level two grad. I, I finished my level two uh, last year with uh, Dominic Matteo. He was, uh, he was my coach and I mainly coach runners right now, but I started off coaching crossfitters and weightlifters from macro-based programs to pro coach, which I've used for over two years now. And um, I wear kind of a few hats as well. So I'm a writer, I, I publish articles and things like women's running and on Runners Connect and things like that. And um, I've just set up a new sort of enterprise where I do I use my nutrition expertise, but also I'm a British weightlifting coach. So I, I do strength coaching for runners as well. So that's currently what I'm doing. Awesome. Thank you, Sam. Uh, and John, everyone here knows John. John has helped at least, uh, at least one person, probably an hour for the last weeks and months. So John's on the header. Tell us what you do. Uh, so I am a strength and conditioning coach primarily. I did my PN level one in 2015 and was like super active in the Facebook group and did some online coaching and stuff like that. I ended up finding my niche working primarily with queer and trans clients, uh, which has been really rewarding, really super exciting. And uh, then the end of 2018, I joined the PN team uh, and I've been moderating the Facebook group ever since. And uh, yeah, I'm currently doing level two. I finished in like two weeks and I submitted my last 
uh, case study last night. So awesome. congrats, uh, well, that's amazing. Let's see if I pass first. <laughs> um, I'm but sure you I, will. I'm super excited to be done that program. It's been really rewarding. It really like crystallized a lot of the stuff about piano that I liked and why I was excited to be on the team. Thanks, John. And we have uh, some uh, level two grads and students joining us. We have uh, Karen, who did her level two with Jay last year. I know Elle is uh, a level two grad as well. And uh, Massimo is doing level two right now as well. I saw Gonzalo is uh, watching live from uh, Santiago, Chile. Yeah, didn't you get a chance to meet him earlier? I did. Yeah, Gonzalo yeah. Gonzalo got a hug for me. This was like the free no hugging days. We, we just got it under the wire. So I, and I actually brought him to his very first CrossFit class with yet another piano oh, coach. Man in Santiago, so that was really cool. Suzanne is celebrating with you, John, last case study. Um, uh, so today we're actually talking about something that I think has been uh, on a lot of people's minds, especially as personal trainers and strength coaches are making a shift uh, towards more online coaching and many folks are shifting to remote working. So selling and marketing, because we talk about offering mm. services Yet it can feel a little strange to be selling right now. So that's what I wanted to uh, to throw to this panel here. I know the questions have been coming up and Tony, I want to pass it over to you because I know you just led a group of level two students through a discussion on that very topic. What did you guys talk about? What were some takeaways? Yeah, I mean, I think um, we've been having a couple of additional live group sessions um, this week, obviously, just to kind of get a feel and really support each other in, in this process and to be able to talk about what's going on. And I think some of the biggest concerns, and we've all, all we've already seen it in the Facebook group as well, is like, well, how do I actually show up in this moment as a coach? Like, what is my moral, ethical, like, how do I... Um, you know, maintain a livelihood and what I need to do. This is how I live. But so it's not icky sticky and it feels authentic and um, we're supporting our clients. But how do I manage both sides of that thing? How do I maintain a business, but also, um, you know, show up in a really authentic way. And we talked a lot about value, adding value. We talked a lot about, you um, how to support themselves, how to support each other, how to some build a community and really think about selling as building community right now versus this hard sell. So uh, we've had a lot of good conversations going on in those L2 groups um, right now. Thanks, Tony. Uh, and Marina actually kicked off this discussion uh, yesterday uh, and she was asking, is it insensitive to try to sell your programs during these pandemic times? So she said she, she said, uh, I honestly feel like an old car salesman promoting my business while some are out of work for undetermined time and mm. might have no idea when they'll have income again. John, can you weigh in? How would you answer Marina? Um, so to me, this has been kind of an interesting uh, time because I primarily work with low income clients anyway. Mm. So I've always taken the approach of my primary goal is to demonstrate value. My primary goal is to get people training. And if they can pay me, that's awesome. And I've done some work in like alternative funding models and stuff like that to be able to do that. Um, and one of the things I've learned from that that's really applicable to this is you won't always be able to sell. Like, and I think people are, there's sometimes there's always been this discussion of people are like, oh, people have the money. They're just not, uh, they're just not prioritizing training. And I just don't agree with that. I think a lot of coaches are now realizing that there are just people who can't afford coaching. Mm -hmm. But what you can always do is demonstrate value. And, dem and so that when they have money, when they have time to think about this, you're the coach they go to. And this is actually such a great opportunity to be the person that everybody thinks of as the coach they want to work with, that they want to recommend. And when that money becomes available, you're going to be the person they turn to. And I think that that's uh, like a really big thing we can all be focusing on now 
is how can I be the best coach that this mm -hmm. one individual knows or this community knows? Thanks, John. And I think what you're pointing out here is that now might be the time. It's always the time to offer value, mm -hmm. but now might also be the time to perhaps shift focus also to the long game because six months from now, um, the things might have settled down a little bit and your name might be the first one on people's lips when they think online coach. Sam, what are your thoughts here as you're listening in here to the conversation so far? My thoughts are, I mean, I, I was quite interested by the wording that, I, would you say it was Marina who started this conversation mm -hmm. about uh, the old car salesman? The, word, the first thing I'd say that, to that is that you're not an old car salesman. Like you're not Mr. Wormwood from Matilda putting sand, like sawdust or whatever he does into the engines of people's cars and basically selling them jalopies and trying to rip them off. Mm -hmm. What we do fundamentally at its core is helping people. So even if you are in a selling for money situation, you are selling something that inherently has a lot of value to people as humans, rather than um, basically a bad product. So I'd say, you know, that thinking of yourself as an old car salesman is, is not something to think of yourself as in the first place in normal times where we're not in a COVID-19 situation. Mm -hmm. The second thing that I would say as well, and I totally forgot to say in my intro, because I always forget that I spent five years doing this, is that obviously my background's in marketing. And there is a big part of marketing at the moment now, especially in the last 10 years, is about building your brand and getting people to trust you. And brand might seem a bit of an icky word, but what we mean when we say brand is, is you, mm -hmm. you as you as a person. Um People, you may be the best person in the world, but if you just pop up in their newsfeed once or if they come across you once, they're not going to inherently trust you. Like uh, Daniel Pink talks about in To Sell as Human, it used to be, you know, um, caveat emptor, which means buyer beware. Now it's caveat vendor because all of the all of the power basically is in is with the buyer. They can find out anything about you with a Google search. They can find out stuff about you on trust pilot they can do all the digging they want and find exactly what they want and it will be you know you can't screen anything from a buyer these days so i'd say that and the brand building as you said this is about the long game and if you're not thinking about your coaching in the long game as it is now or you weren't before then this is a great opportunity to learn that people you could be the best coach in the world, but they're not going to see your ad on Instagram and then buy. That's not what happens. You have to turn up every day and provide things for free mm -hmm. of value and just give everything away that you have and say, just basically show them who you are. That's, mm -hmm. that's what it's about. And I think this is a good exercise in, in why we do that. That was a really long answer. I'm sorry, but that, that, that I had a lot of thoughts. That was, that was good. I think we all have a lot of thoughts. I love that. And um, so what Lisa brought up the other day, kind of in line with our conversation, uh, and I think Marina was sharing that same thought, is that people might feel icky. And I think it's mm. such an interesting way of describing, right? Like we hear words like icky and sleazy and uh, predatory and mm. taking advantage. And the way I think about it, and I've, I've shared that with some coaches uh, in the last few weeks, is that as a rule, and this doesn't have to take place in pandemic times, but when people say, I hate selling, mm -hmm. what they usually mean is they have had an experience or many when they hated being sold to, mm -hmm. and they don't want to do that. So if you're thinking words like sleazy and icky, and there is this like guttural away response that you're feeling right now, uh, I think that it encourage you to lean into that and maybe reflect on what are some of these experiences that you had when you just felt that when you're like ah that's just not how I want to sell and I actually want want to ask uh, you guys here if you can think of an example and I'll, I'll share an example that I've received in the last week and maybe if you're watching live or tuning in later you can share some examples in the comments of marketing right now that didn't feel right. So I got uh, a newsletter about a week ago from an airline and I won't name names, uh, but it was a very small local airline. And because I usually travel and fly quite a bit, I actually receive a lot of new newsletters from local airlines in many countries around the world. So 
the summary of the newsletter was, uh, if you're worried about coronavirus, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Just wash your hands. Traveling is totally safe. And here's a discount. And it just, I just had such a push away response from that. And to me, I think it was a great example of like, hey, like that's, that's definitely not what I want to do, right? Like I, I don't want to come to my clients and say, are you freaked out about coronavirus right now? You know what you need? You need a coach. Only now, only today. Like, that to me, what I think have that same feeling. Uh, so as I speak, did anything ring for you? Like whether it's current times related or just in general, like what was the experience that you just felt that way? Sam's nodding. Go for it. Yeah, because I'm part of a local, uh, quite, a, quite a few running clubs and triathlon clubs and things like that. And I saw something where uh, basically the gyms in our area are still, as I said, I'm in a, one of the least affected areas in the UK. So a, a lot of them are still remaining open because of gov the government advice isn't, um, isn't very clear on whether they should shut or not. But there's still, we're kind of in a weird transition phase, probably about a week or two behind the US. And um, in this sort of period of uncertainty where people aren't really sure and people are leaning towards staying at home, someone, someone just popped up and said, by the way, I'm a personal trainer and you might not be able to work out with other people in all those silly gyms that have shut. I'll meet you in the middle of a park and the, we can have like 50 of us and I'll lead you through a workout um, for a nominal fee or whatever. And I was just like, Number one, that's stupid. Like, because we've been told, we have been told to like to avoid social gatherings. But it's also like stepping on gyms that are really in a lot of trouble. So you don't have a business that's in trouble and that sort of thing at the moment. So you're trying to make them look bad and profit off the fact that people can't really go to a gym. And also, it's not a great idea <laughs> to set something like that up anyway in times like these. It felt very, yeah, I didn't like it at all. Sam, and what uh, came up as you were speaking for me, like you're saying, it, and I think that applies for marketing at any time, it's that sense of like throwing somebody else under the bus, yeah. right? Like the, you know, gyms are closing and gyms are not just gyms because I, yeah. mm. I know so many coaches and gym owners. This is not just tragic from the financial perspective. Uh, gym owners are closing doors, to mm. essentially a place where they gather family like that's mm. that's how close that community uh becomes and so yeah i appreciate you you sharing that yeah, yeah i think for oh, i was Sorry. just gonna say sam, so sam i was just gonna say you know uh since we're talking about like that sales that marketing the things that don't feel good um it it really, I think it's apparent across our Instagram feeds and our Facebook feeds right now. Like, I think we can see, um, you know, the snake oil, you know, salesman coming out and trying to take advantage. Uh, and, and that's really where we don't want to go. Right. I mean, it, my experience has been very recent in terms of, I don't like trying to be sold like all these supplements or all these things that all of a sudden are popping up around the coronavirus. A, it's it's not socially responsible for any of these coaches to be out there doing that. But um, yeah, that's my current, like you asked Kate, like what's your current icky, sticky, like sales experience? Man, it is going on every day right now. And um, I, I feel like we have this responsibility as coaches to, try to change that conversation and, and make sure that that is something we can be doing in terms of like, how do we sell, you know, sell ourselves in this moment, right? How do we add value, add value to that conversation? Make sure your clients are knowing that, you know, there is nothing out there that they can do in terms of supplements or anything like that. Um, and just joining the conversation in a really positive way um, can be really helpful. And it can just kind of counteract some of that. Like you said, use car salesman and snake oil salesman kind of um, experiences that we're all having. Sure. Uh, so John, I was actually going to throw this to you. So what folks were wondering about, I've seen that come up a number of times, if uh, anyone here has experience with pay what you want models. And I, mm. I know that's something you've experimented with. You've mentioned alternative pricing. So can you speak a little bit to how you've incorporated that? And what did you use? Like what did you use a particular platform or was what did your support look like? Um, so I run low income coaching 
primarily for queer and trans folks because uh, it's a woefully underserved demographic um, and it's my community as well. Um, and I started a Patreon a couple of years ago where I basically said, hey, I'm going to coach people. I'm just going to coach people who need it. I'm not going to put a lot of effort into filtering and assessing people's mm -hmm. income. Just if someone tells me they can't pay, I'm going to coach them. Wouldn't it be cool if I got paid for that? Um, and people just overwhelmingly started supporting me on Patreon just from that, just from me saying, hey, I'm going to do this anyway. Throw me a bit of money. And within that, with those low income folks, I give them the option of sliding scale. So That's I tell neat. them the scale starts at zero. Mm -hmm. And then I tell mm -hmm. them what my standard price is. Excuse me. <clears throat> so the, uh, so many of them do contribute something. It's just much lower than what sort of my regular clients would pay. Like I have clients who pay me $10, $15 an hour stuff like that which is on top of the patreon and largely actually that money is about they want to pay something mm -hmm. they don't want to feel like they're paying nothing even if that option is available like most people want to pay something for your time and what's really cool about that is i've got a bunch of clients who are not going to pay 60 70 dollars an hour mm -hmm. and it's not because they don't value that they do they literally don't have 60 70 dollars an hour once twice a week and for me, the Patreons really allowed me to take on clients that no one else is serving, which has actually meant uh, last year I had to close my books because mm -hmm. I had so many clients and I was actually, this was working so well that I was like, I'm actually getting a bit overwhelmed. I'm going to take a little bit of a step back. Mm -hmm. So I still run the Patreon and I still do sliding scale pricing. And between the two of them, I'm making like I've been making plenty of money for my coaching time. Um, but it's it's really fundamentally allowed me to serve people that no other coach is talking to, that no other coach is working to. And then marketing becomes relatively easy, right? All they need to do is trust you. And like I said, many of them end up paying me something. Or when they're doing financially better, they end up paying full price. Um like I remember I sold out a course. It was like eight people, six week course, and it was very lucrative. But every single person who signed up for it and paid the full price was someone that I had given free coaching to. And part of it was just this model of, hey, I'm a coach, I can do this, I'm good at it, I'm just gonna do it and the money will work itself out. And mm. giving people the opportunity to give me money for it. And it sounds like that really, it, it's, it, that's quite the way to pivot, right? It's a very unconventional way of going about it because you found yourself competing uh, that expression of blue ocean. Have you guys heard the expression? It's the, the blue ocean versus red ocean, right? Like that red ocean with sharks eating at each other as we're all competing for resources versus finding a little corner of the blue ocean mm -hmm. where no one really is. And, and that uh, really sounds like what John's practice ended up, uh, ended up doing. Um, I think like to bring it back to what Sam said about uh, the ickiness coming from people competing with other coaches or putting other coaches or gyms mm -hmm. down. Like I've always said that if you view yourself as competing with all the other coaches, you're missing out on these mm -hmm. populations that no one is competing for. And it's a fundamental shift from how traditionally fitness has been done to just be like, well, oh, maybe I'm not competing with other coaches. Maybe I'm competing with the fact that people have always thought that they're not fitness people. And maybe if I focus on getting those people to go to the gym once, I'll be the person who coaches them forever because I'm the person who did that. And I think that's a way to avoid ickiness and all this as well is to not frame yourself as competing with other people who are struggling too, but to focus on we're all in this together and here's what I can offer, not here's what I'm offering that's different than everybody else. Thanks, John. Uh, I want to address a question from Kirsty North uh, that just came in. So she said that I struggle with growing organic audience. Uh, my page members pretty much are all known to me. Any, any advice? It, what uh, channel, does, does she mention which channel she's working 
she's talking about like a, a Facebook I'm page. I'm assuming it's a Facebook page or a Facebook personal profile. And uh, I don't think she's alone in asking kind of the question of how do you break out of that small network that you're starting out with where you are essentially might be feeling like you're marketing to friends and family or relatives. Yeah, I, I, I've got some thoughts on that. If, yeah, go for it, if Sam. I um, so as I say, as someone who used to work in marketing that, and you will hear a lot about algorithms on Facebook and Instagram, which they're pretty much the same thing now because they're both owned by Facebook. In terms of the business page or the Instagram business page, how many followers you have or how many people you're reaching or even trying to reach people through those channels by posting is not effective anymore. Like Facebook realized pretty early on. I mean, I used to work for Breaking Muscle and uh, they had over 200,000 likes on their Facebook um, when they changed the algorithm, I was there when they changed the algorithm, it went from this has been shared 10,000 times to this has been shared too. So face, when face, Facebook basically realized we've given you these likes, you can't just reach them when you want them to, you have to pay to reach them. So I would say that the, the thing, what I'd, what I'd really love to see coaches move away from is this focus on page likes and Instagram followers and things like that. Um, you can do like sort of workarounds by working on the Facebook group up like because the algorithm bumps that up by doing lives, but basically put information out there on your personal page and um, talk to people like John Goodman has a great practice where you talk to five people every day about a fitness tip or something like that, that you share on your, your personal page as well, because the business page is just, it's under about five stacks of paper figuratively speaking on the Facebook news page and don't focus so much about on like posting on business approved channels because it is, it's going into the ether and it's going nowhere and personally I think that it's just better to talk in online and in person about what you do to get comfortable talking about what you do and try and find and merge with your inner extrovert and be okay with messaging people on Facebook Messenger and saying, hi, you liked my post. What did you like about it? You know, for me, it's just like, what are you, what are you training for at the moment? And that sort of thing. Um, it's socially awkward, uh, but uh, like, or it might feel, feel awkward, but that means that not a lot of people are doing it. So I would say that, like really move away from uh, what Facebook wants you or thinks wants you to think you should be doing with your business pages or your Instagram business pages. Um, to put it into perspective, just finally to round, round this off, um, I post on Facebook groups. I have like a group strategy when I have something about running to say, I post it on groups. And um, I had a post about not doing weight training in your running shoes. And it got, sh it got shared 200 times and over a hundred thousand people saw it. I didn't pay a penny for that. I've never got that kind of reach for Facebook ads. It was literally so really, just that shift to organic reach and kind of reaching out to connections that you already know, right? So it's, you will be starting with that personal network. Um, Tony, I was wondering, like, Gail, I think, mentioned something earlier. She was asking, would it be safe to say that people are suddenly looking at their health situation and are looking for reliable help at this time? Like you coach people in so many different, like you coach both coaches and you coach mm. regular people. What are you sensing? What do people need? Yeah, I, it really, I mean, uh, we coach individualized coaching and what we're seeing in terms of how clients are showing up is a full continuum. We have people, like you said, who are leaning in really heavily to this idea that they know that maybe if they um, work on their health and they feel better, uh, it's going to help them get through this. And it doesn't mean that you won't get coronavirus. I think we need to be clear about that. It, we can be the healthiest person in the world and we can still get coronavirus. But um, I think it's opening up this awareness around how they practice health. And that is true. But you also are going to have several clients who also are just feeling the anxiety, the pressure, the stress. They don't know. And they're actually moving away from that health line um, and maybe back into more comforting behaviors because that's what they know. So I think you're going to have clients coming to you um, or you might already be working with clients that 
ban the spectrum. So Kate, I know that wasn't a great like, hey, yeah, everybody who hears about this or in this, this. Yeah, everybody who's in this moment is going to be thinking, rah, rah, my health, you know, they're, they're not, they're going to be thinking like, what are my basics? And as a coach, I think we have an opportunity here to show up and say, what do you need from me as a coach right now? Is it managing your minimums? Is it just figuring out how to talk about health in a really basic way? Is it just figuring out how to construct a schedule at home? Cause you've never had to like be at home this much, or is it, Hey, like I am in this, like somebody coming to you to say, Oh my gosh, I realize my health is super important to me now. How can I, you know, at the end of the day, it's always about meeting your clients where they're at. Well, and it's that continuum, right? As you mentioned, and I love that because I think what we're going to see, and we really don't know where we're going to land yet. We're still talking about the fact that, yay, increased demand for online coaching. And I think that's definitely going to be the case. There will be more demand for online coaching right now, and people will be more willing to maybe pay for it now. However, there might also be less demand for online coaching as people are prioritizing where their finances go, right? So if all of a sudden I've lost income Mm -hmm. overnight and I'm really thinking of folks that are not able to do what they do, like Mm -hmm. massage therapists, like chiropractors, like if your job is directly related, personal trainers, hello, to being in the physical space with a person and this is exactly what we're trying to minimize right now. So all of a sudden, there might be less demand and online coaching for that very reason. It's scarce resources and the limited financial uh, just possibilities. And I don't know where we're going to land. Like, what is going to be the net impact of, of this, right? Like, is online coaching going to shoot through the roof because there is more uh, impact? Because there are kind of two things pulling it in two opposite directions, as I see it. Yeah, I think there is that, like the both directions um, and and what the definition of coaching is. We might have to move out of this idea, even if I'm going to transition my business to online coaching. What do people actually need right now? I mean, do they need you to show up and talk about um, how many vegetables on, are on their plate? Um, it might be more lifestyle and wellness coaching that we are talking about as we start this shift. And then it might transition more into heavier nutrition, fitness coaching. So we might want to think about how we're showing up as coaches as well and what what we have to offer. So that sense of uh, asking your client what they might need right now, like even the existing clients. Mm. uh, And it's interesting that we're not really talking yet about make everything free especially if this is the way you're making a living, right? And John has talked about one way of serving uh, low income folks. So what are your thoughts on like free stuff, like making stuff free, heavily discounted right now? I, th- I think that um, that's kind of my MO anyway, because I believe that all of the things that we coach uh, is already out there. And I'm, I'm going to mm-hmm. include a PN in this. Their blog is absolutely a comprehensive nutrition resource. It's pretty much the textbook online um, if, you, if you're if you able to search it. So everything in ProCoach, everything that we're qualified in is all written down and available on the internet anyway. Um, I think what they're looking for is some direction, some accountability, and for someone, for a co- which is what a coach does, and for a coach to say, I see that you're struggling at the moment and I'm here for it. You know, they're not going to find that online. So for me personally, if it, um, the strategy that we're doing at the moment um, for our demographic, so for runners is like, here's some mobility drills. Here's some at-home workouts. Here's some strength tests that you can do while you've got this spare time. And we're not going to gate that at all because um, it's like that old sort of cheesy saying that they don't remember anything apart from how you've made them feel. And if they feel heard and they feel like you've helped them, there is no amount of money that you can spend to, in ads to replicate that at all. People are vulnerable and they need to know that they're going to be okay and that they're seen and that there are people in communities out there who are willing to lead them. And this is the opportunity for that. And I don't personally think that anything should be gated in a situation like that. 
Thanks, Tim. I, I appreciate that. And I mean, what I'm seeing, I've had a conversation with uh, a private client the other day, and she came to the end of her coaching package. So my question to her was, how do you want to proceed right now? How can I support you? And what I've offered her is flexibility. So uh, usually, gonna, this is what I do, how frequently I do it, and these are my typical rates. But given the circumstances, I said, hey, instead of talking for an hour bi-weekly, would it be better if we talked for a shorter amount of time, but weekly? Uh, would it be helpful if I delayed your invoicing by a month or two or three, right? To still provide you with that support, uh, but provide flexible solutions. Liz actually shared what she does now. Uh, she opened up slots in her Calendly schedule for 15 minute calls to just talk about anything. And she's also doing a nightly Facebook lives, uh, just also anything from time blocking to workouts, trying to provide a place to connect. Uh, we have a question from Neil. Uh, busy with PM level one cert. I uh, also have a training facility at my house and I was planning on starting my personal training and online nutrition coaching business this time um, in Ontario, Canada. Was planning on launching an advertising campaign this week or next week. Um, uh, she ordered the flyers, she or he ordered flyers uh, Monday morning for the promotion, but canceled the order after the announcement and is unsure of where to start now. So can you share your thoughts with Neil? Um, I think that's I, a pretty common one right now. Uh, John, what do you think? Uh, I, like, I feel like when you said you canceled the flyers, I was like, excellent. Cause I just don't like, I've never used flyers. I have business cards, but business cards are always uh, a thing that I give people after an in-person interaction with them. And like where I would start right now is just go onto your personal Facebook page and ask people how you can help them and make yourself available. And because you're starting out just and because you probably have a bit of spare time, like I'm assuming, um, consider just offering a couple of, like the first session is free or the first two clients are free or pay what you can, but just get started coaching and get started talking about it. Talk about it every single day. Like uh, Sam mentioned the John Goodman thing, talk to five people a day about what you do. Start that. Um, and put it out to your community and just earnestly say, hey, what do you need right now? And how can I help you? And then do that. And by the time we get past this, you will have probably some testimonials you can use. You'll have a bunch of clients who, uh, whether they were paying full price, whether they got in under the wire and were your first three clients or did they first three sessions, who will recommend you to your friends or to their friends. And you'll be really solid about what you need to move forward. Like for me, it's just ask what you can, what they want from you and just give it to them and give them the, the flip side of the low income thing is you also have to ask them uh, for money and give them the opportunity to pay you. Cause if you just say, Oh, well, I guess it's free. They'll never pay you for it, but work out a plan with them. Like say, okay, after the third session, you're, are you able to start paying me or when you go back to work, like have that awkward and difficult conversation right at the start and create a plan with them about what they can afford, but just get training with them. So that was kind of a long answer, but basically the answer is get started in whatever capacity that means right now. Thanks, John. Tell me. John, can I just add there? Because I just want to tag on to something John said, which was he mentioned the word community. And I think right now, above anything else, if you can go out and talk to people and talk about building community and and the and connecting with the type of clients and um, and honestly, if you just talk and are authentic you're going to attract the right community to you. And um, it's really just about getting out there and sharing as much as possible and um, things will follow through. Um, 
so that's, I just wanted to add that because I just, I want to highlight the community piece because I think it's really key right now. I think really in line with that, Tony, there's something I wanted to throw out. So um, Devin Gray shared the other day, he said, uh, I'm growing my business as usual. My mm -hmm. personal training business is already taking hits. Um, however, people realize that my business is hurting. They expect me to adapt and still earn a living. And everybody is 100% supportive. So what I want to point out here, and I'll give you guys a very specific example. There are two coffee shops in the small town where I live, and uh, I frequent them both. One of those coffee shops, they both had to close in the last mm -hmm. 48 hours. One of those coffee shops announced on their Instagram that they're going to be delivering coffee to my door, if I would like, for a small delivery fee. The other one did not, uh, for whatever reason. I don't know what that reason is. However, I now have an option to continue supporting one of those coffee shops. And I had my coffee delivered to my door today. Mm -hmm. And the way I think about it, of, of supporting my local community, I actually could have gone out and got, gotten a coffee through drive through uh, Those are still open. It was a more expensive than average coffee, the money I am right now saving on gas because I'm not really driving around, I am more than happy to put towards a more expensive coffee so I can support a business in my town. And I think your clients will think the same way. So they will want to support you. You do need to give them a way to do so, right? So you notice how I don't really have an option right now of supporting that other coffee shop because mm -hmm. they just closed. So Andrea it actually has asked a question. Um, she's saying right now she feels like she kind of has to provide that discount to her clients, but also feels like she needs to make a living. So how do we find that line? So to me, I think it ties in here a little bit where I would actually question whether discount is where your mind should go first. So do your clients need that discount? Because me as somebody working remotely, if I continue working with my coach, um, nothing has changed for me yet. So mm -hmm. I don't need that discount yet. Maybe I will need it six months from now, but right now I may just need more accountability. What are your thoughts on that? I would say it'd be definitely um, not something that I would offer off the cuff as a I'll just offer that because COVID-19, like I wouldn't say that because as you say, there, there are people out there whose, whose incomes, like most of us included, who aren't really affected by what's going on. And if there's one of us, there's a lot of us as well. Um, I think because who's not going to as well, who, who's not going to say, well, yeah, sure, give me a discount even if they're, they're perfectly fine. And I would say as well for the trainer in question, if you're offering a discount and you're resenting it, that will by osmosis transfer into your coaching. So um, I'd say on the opposite end of that, I always offer a money back guarantee on my coaching because that really puts it mm -hmm. on me to, to make it excellent. Because unless it's excellent, I'm giving them the money back. It's the same sort of thing. If you offer it them at a the discount, then you're gonna give them whatever percentage discount version of your program. And that's going to lead to a dead end sale, a client that's not going to talk about you and evangelize about you to your to their friends. So I would say if you if you have reservations about offering a discount, I, I you resent it, and there's nothing wrong with that. Especially if you're struggling financially, there's nothing wrong with that. We all need to make a living. Um, then don't offer it. Would and you know there's the difference there because uh, your entire coaching model can be based on discounted or free or pay mm -hmm. what you can coaching as John's, right? And in that case, John, if you were, you know, if you're coaching people right now based on that model, nothing really changes for you because people still pay what they can. Uh, and you yep. may see the number fluctuate. However, if your pricing is not set up that way, and like Sam, uh, Sam said, you're now resenting or really feeling that financial hit, that's not, not necessarily the first place to start what do they need so like one of the things that uh, my studio offers uh, a sliding scale but the sliding scale are 
set amounts. So mm -hmm. there's a low income average and uh, a higher price. Mm -hmm. So we give people the option of actually paying more. It's about 50% more. And when we before we introduced that, we found workshops and public stuff was uh, they were they were doing okay, but there was a there was a not very many people in them. Since we introduced that, and we also say, hey, contact us if you can afford the low mm -hmm. the low access rate, which is like fifteen dollars, so it's very cheap. Um, since we introduced that, we ran the numbers recently. We make slightly more money but our public programs have are completely full. Mm -hmm. And it's that thing of like a bunch of our existing people are actually paying more than they would have before. If we offered it at $45, they paid $45. But the second we gave them the option to pay 60, they pay 60 because, and like, that's what I would say about discount. That's what Sam highlighted is if you just discount something, that's the price. That's the price people pay. They don't think of it as discounted. But if you have an earnest conversation with people where you're like, hey, what can you afford? And you give them an option that's higher than your average and lower than your average, and that's your range. And you're just like, hey, I want to get you in, coat. like I get want to get you working out. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll find that many people will actually opt to pay more. Many people will be really, really happy to pay what is actually your average rate. Mm -hmm. And the people who maybe can only pay $15 a session, they're not going to another coach. They're not like going to suddenly wake up tomorrow and be able to pay you $70. So that's an extra 15 bucks. And you get that positive interaction with a client where you gave what they needed. So on the discounts thing, I would say don't offer a discount, have earnest conversations with mm -hmm. your community about what they can afford and do that on an individual basis because you'll find some people will actually in this if you're honest about where you're at and your needs they might actually pay you more and that's just never going to happen in a discount scenario that just becomes your new normal and that's your price and then when you have to discount it again for maybe low-income folks you're actually making significantly less Thanks, John. I appreciate like you, you're really focusing on kind of that going back to the client, right? And um, doing your best to serve them instead of assuming where, where they are. Uh, so uh, I want to be cognizant of our time today. This was uh, quite the, the deep and reflectful topic. Reflectful. Can I um, just, I want to add another perspective really quick here because I, yeah. not perspective, it's not, it's not the right word, but an alternative. And this is an alternative that I heard from a gym owner who had to close their doors. Um, and it was kind of interesting. And it just talks to what John was saying about the goodness of people and wanting to support our gym owners, wanting to support our personal trainers, that sort of thing. And he actually made it an opt in. So privately everybody had to say yes like he was basically saying nobody has to pay but if you feel you can pay um, and continue to pay your membership fees during this time please let me know opt in that helps me pay my employees that helps me pay you know and his his thought is is he's just going to offer additional services to those people when his doors can go back open. So the people who opt in now to continue to pay will just get something extra special later. And I know that we didn't really talk about that sort of thing, but I think it's so another way we can get creative here and, and we can think outside of the box in terms of um, how we can continue to have revenue streams come in and maybe what we can do to thank those people who are supporting us you know, yeah. here in three to six months, so. Thank you, Tony. And I mean, uh, I see there's quite a bit of interest right now, I think, especially in uh, helping out uh, folks that are struggling financially. Mm -hmm. I have questions just about John's approach. So if you want to hear more from John about how John has been approaching this, please let us know in the comments and uh, maybe I can twist twist his arm into sharing more with us. Um, meanwhile, I want to thank you three uh, for joining me today and sharing your insights. And uh, for those of you watching either live or later, thank you for taking time out of your day. And if you have any questions, let us know in the comments and we will see you 
for more tomorrow at 12 p.m. Eastern right here in the Facebook group. Do a little group wave. Can we do a hug? Hugs. Hugs. Hugs.